Welcome back to Case of the Sunday Scaries. I'm Elise. And I'm Annie. And Annie is coming back two times in a row this week woo woo, to bring <laughs> you guys a mini-sode. As we said before, we are doing a lot of extra content all throughout spooky season, and today is no different because Annie, in true Case of the Sunday Scaries form, has completely changed what she was going to be talking <laughs> about today. And Annie, what are we going over today? Yeah, this episode really got away from me. I had planned to do something completely different. And then I was actually out at a bar with some friends watching the Broncos. And one of my friends talked about how she went to App State in North Carolina. And I was immediately intrigued. I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's so many haunted things in those mountains, right? Right. And she she was like, I've kind of heard about those. You know, not a lot. So I am covering some Appalachian legends and myths and ghost stories. And this is going to be the perfect episode for if you're ever around a campfire and you're like, I have nothing, no ghost stories up my sleeve. I'm going to give you like five. (laughs) So just get the flashlight out, put it under your chin, and then play this episode and just lip, can we say (laughs) lip sync? Just mouth along as if you're telling the story. (laughs) Turn the light a little bit to the left so you can't really see your lips and just let me do all the talking. But I also feel like this is the perfect timing because it's October and in the eastern part of the U.S. is just gorgeous right now. All the leaves are changing. They're all falling. It's getting darker and colder. And I don't know, something about being in a dark forest kind of freaks me out. So this is this is good timing for this episode. This is good. And I'm coming in with all the spooky ooky feelings because I just left the Stanley Hotel literally an hour and a half ago. So maybe that will be covered in a future episode. Yeah, I'm ready for some scary stories. You're also sitting in like a pitch black room. Well, you know, I'm ready. I'm, <laughs> I got my campfire going, a little candle lit. I'm ready for the haunting. All right, let's get into it. If you're unfamiliar with the Appalachian Mountains, they are a massive mountain range that extend approximately 1,500 miles. The mountains begin in the north in Newfoundland, Canada. I said that weird. (laughs) Canada. Canada. I was getting so serious, too. And they extend as far south as Alabama in the U.S. This mountain range is known for its heavily forested terrain and rugged hiking trails, including the famous Appalachian Trail which is a journey that covers roughly 2,000 miles. And nothing Um, you will ever see me doing. No, especially not after this episode. I won't even go overnight in the Appalachian Mountains. It's not for the faint of heart. It takes roughly five to seven months to hike. Yes, months. It's also the longest hiking-only footpath in the world. One thing that's unique about this part of the country is the culture and rich history. Appalachian culture is known for superstitions, legends, myths, and mountain folklore that have been passed down by countless generations. Folklore has always fascinated me because it's the traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a community passed through the generations by word of mouth. I love the idea of, you know, a grandma telling her grandbaby stories that she heard as a little girl. And people in this region really lean in on this piece of the past. Well, and not only that, you have to think with every story or with every lie, they always say there's a shred of truth. Yes. And some of these truths are going to blow your mind. I am not a fan of stereotyping specific groups of people, but there are a lot of stereotypes when it comes to people of the Appalachian Mountains. One term is hillbilly, which I don't find that offensive because I kind of was called one growing up. But in truth, Appalachian Mountain people are a very proud, complex population with their own unique culture that has resisted change for the last two centuries. And I find that very admirable. One story that I can almost guess is one of the more popular ones is the story of Naomi Wise. Naomi's 1808 murder was the inspiration behind a few popular ballads that are common today in the Appalachian region. And if you can picture some blues music with banjos and a whole lot of soul, that's what these tributes to the young girl sound like. Naomi Wise was a young orphan girl who was raised by William and Mary Adams. While working for the family, Naomi met a man named Jonathan Lewis, who lived a few miles away and passed by the Adams residence on his way to and from work. The Adams family warned Naomi about Jonathan. Yes, he was good looking and charming, and he came from a powerful family, but he was known for having a temper, and that scared the family that loved Naomi so much. But like most teenagers, Naomi was taken under his spell. She quickly fell in love with him, and he gave the impression of being equally in love with her. Jonathan lured her into a relationship in which she became pregnant at only 19 years old. 
While he was having this relationship with Naomi, he was seeing his employer's sister, Miss Hetty Elliott, and he was trying to establish a relationship with her. Love the name Hetty. And it's very fitting for this story, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah. Her family was very wealthy and very well known. And Jonathan saw this as an opportunity to live a really stable life, something that he lacked. He was trying to level up. Exactly. When Jonathan found out Naomi was pregnant, he knew his chances with Hetty would be ruined. He schemed up an evil plan and promised Naomi marriage and wealth, and he asked her to meet him by the river one evening and said that he was going to marry her so that she wouldn't be disgraced by having a baby. Remember, this is the year 1808 when having a baby out of wedlock was frowned upon. On that evening, Naomi went to the river and met Jonathan, and they proceeded to ride on horseback toward Rattleman, a small city where they were supposed to get married. They started crossing the river, but midstream, Jonathan paused. He told Naomi what a fool she had been for believing he would marry her, and with those last words, threw her from his horse into the water where he proceeded to drown her. (gasps) Okay, so not only is she going along thinking this is like this romantic midnight meetup with her lover, and then he quickly turns it from, JK, not marrying you. I'm going to drown you instead. Great guy. The next morning, Naomi's body was found downriver and brought to shore. People were immediately suspicious of Jonathan and quickly named him the murderer. Jonathan was captured and brought to the river for questioning. He was indicted in jail for the murder of Naomi, but soon escaped jail and fled west. Several years later, he was found and brought back to stand trial. By that time, many of the witnesses had either died or moved away, and there was not enough sufficient evidence to convict him. On his deathbed, it was said that the apparition of Naomi was standing before Jonathan and that he was absolutely tormented by her image. Before his last breath, he confessed to her murder. The Naomi Wise Ballad is said to be North Carolina's principal single contribution to American balladry based on its distribution and dissemination, thus making Naomi and her death one of North Carolina's best-known folk ballads. I wanted to start off this episode just to give a little piece of that rich soul history that the Appalachian region has. You might be wondering... Why? Like, why was her murder so important to North Carolina? And why is her murder the theme behind all of these songs? Singer-songwriter Donna Hughes kind of answers this question. She said the Ballad of Naomi Wise is a timeless story of how the rich take advantage of the poor and how men can take advantage of women. I'll post some snippets of this ballad because it's absolutely beautiful and just like very on beat and just brings back kind of her story and I love this happened in 1808, and it's now 2022, and it's one of North Carolina's most popular songs. Switching over to something a little more haunting, let's talk about the Bell Witch, or the Bell Witch Haunting. Are you familiar? I have heard little bits and pieces, but I'm glad you're covering this because I don't know the true story. This is scary. It's a legend from the Southern U.S. folklore centered on the 19th century Bell Farm of Northwest Robertson County, Tennessee. John and Lucy Bell were farmers who settled in Adams, Tennessee around the year 1803. They lived peacefully on their land until 1817 when the family began experiencing odd and unexplainable occurrences in their home. These occurrences included odd noises like scratching and knocking on the walls, They heard chains being dragged across the floor, and these noises became more frequent and intense over time. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I don't like grinding noises in general. My mom, poor thing, was filing her nails in the car, and I was like, Mom, you got to stop that today. (laughs) It's driving me nuts. For some reason, like claw marks or scratching on windows or anytime you hear about hauntings, that sticks out to me as something that'd be so scary because it's so ominous. Like, I'm coming. Oh, yeah. And and hearing chains being dragged across the floor. So scary. Eventually, the Bell's daughter started complaining that when they'd go to sleep, something would pull at their covers and pinch them. This thing would even go so far as to physically harm the kids, kicking, punching, and scratching them. These paranormal events happened for over a year, and the Bells didn't tell a soul. They were worried about what the members of their church in town might think of them. Eventually, the occurrences and harassment got so bad that John Bell, the father, finally confided to one of his neighbors about the strange incidents in his home. 
His neighbor came over and he immediately experienced the same kind of disturbances. Word quickly spread of this haunting and people all over the East and Southeast knew about it. The Appalachian ghost story eventually became famous enough to reach General Andrew Jackson. What? Yeah. How is he coming into the mix? According to the legend, General Jackson and his party's men set up their tents outside of the bell house. One man claimed he had knowledge of how to deal with witches, and he was boasting that his silver bullets were keeping the witch away all day. Oh, I bet she was a redhead. (laughs) (laughs) To punish him, the witch set her sights on the man, giving him a beating that had all of the men begging to leave the property. Normal folks also began traveling to the Bell Farm to experience the supernatural phenomenon for themselves. Some came as curiosity seekers and others as skeptics, trying to debunk what the Bells were experiencing. What is insanely scary is that this thing fed off of attention and people's fears. Ooh, so it's kind of like picking up on people's energy and using that as a catalyst to what? Become more and more powerful? Yes, definitely to get stronger. It got so strong that eventually it developed a whispering voice, and within a year it could actually it could speak. Absolutely not. Sometimes the spirit would show up disguised as an animal, such as a dog or a bird. Other times it was this invisible being that kind of wandered around the farm, bringing coldness and darkness with it. As it learned to speak, it learned to argue specifically about religion, and it would make fun of every person except for Mrs. Bell, the wife. It stated that its purpose and reason for existing was to kill John Bell, the patriarch of the family. The spirit received the name Kate after it claimed to be the witch of a local lady named Kate Batts. Supposedly, Kate was cheated in a land purchase by John Bell, and that was the reason for her actions. When John Bell died on December 20th, 1980, under suspicious circumstances, Kate took credit, insisting she had poisoned him because he was a bad man. After John's death, things began to return to normal on the farm until Betsy Bell, the Bell's youngest daughter, became engaged to a local man named Joshua Gardner. Uh Uh-oh, she likes to interfere with people's relationships. She does, and Kate did not approve of this upcoming marriage. She actually talked Betsy into breaking off the engagement with Joshua. I don't know what she said or how she convinced her, but this marriage never happened. Could you imagine you go to your in-laws, you're like, you know, I love your son a lot, but the witch that's haunting my house has had a little powwow session with me. We've sat down, we've wrote our pros and cons list, and it's just, it's not going to be in the cards because, you know, the witch Kate told me I can't do it. Yeah, I can. I am afraid of her. A short time later, the spirit said she was going to leave, but promised to return in seven years. Seven years later, Kate did return, visiting John Bell Jr., who was now living at the Bell Farm. Allegedly, the two talked for three nights about the past, the present, and the future. And after that, the Bell Witch bid farewell and promised to return in 107 years. That would have been in 1935. Some say she returned. Some say she didn't. But the real story behind the tale of the Bell Witch has never been uncovered. Some do think it was an act of the supernatural. Skeptics accuse the Bell family of doing it um, by trying to get money, but the Bell family never charged a penny to anyone staying over in their home. I think they liked the company, to be honest. Absolutely. (laughs) Come one, come all. This is a mystery and it gives me chills. I do not mess with unhappy spirits trying to seek revenge. I hate to say this because I don't ever un- like pretend to understand people's financial situations, but I would be out of there. If someone is scratching and shaking my kids, sorry, I will go live in a cardboard box at the edge of a church and I will stay there for seven years until Miss Kate finds a way out of that house. Especially since the witch was becoming stronger and like fed off of fear. I would be scared shitless. I would have a ton of energy to give this thing. Next up is a story around some mysterious lights that can be found to this very day in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. These lights are called the Brown Mountain Lights, and they are a true Appalachian mountain mystery. These mysterious lights have been appearing in this mountainous area for hundreds of years. According to the Cherokee legend, around 1200 A.D., a great battle was fought between the Cherokee and Catawba Native Americans at Brown Mountain. According to the legend, in the evenings, 
the Native American women went searching for their sons, husbands, brothers, and fathers, using torch lights to guide them. Many claim that the lights seen today are the spirits of the Catawba women still searching for their loved ones. Oh, that is heartbreaking. Locals and tourists alike have reported glowing orb-like lights in blue, white, orange, and red, hovering approximately 15 feet off the ground in the Brown Mountain area. The lights have been investigated three different times by the U.S. government and countless times by private groups and often studied by students at App State University. The lights were even featured in an episode of The X-Files back in 1999. If any of our listeners have ever seen these lights, please let us know because I am so curious. Not only am I curious, but there has to be some pretty substantial reporting here for the U.S. government to get themselves involved in trying to figure out what this is. Three different times. Oh, yeah. The Appalachian Mountains have a lot of wildlife, including bats, moose, deer, black bears, foxes, and supposedly one particular race of humans called the Moon-Eyed People. According to Cherokee legend, long ago before the Cherokees moved into the Smokies, there was a race of small, bearded white men who lived in the mountains. The men lived in rounded log cabins, and they had large blue eyes and fair white skin. They were sun-blind during the day, emerging from their homes only at night to hunt and fish. Because they could only see in the dark, the Cherokee called them the Moon-Eyed People. Some believe they were descendants of a small group of Welshmen who came to America long before the Spanish and settled in the Smoky Mountains around 1100 AD. As the legend goes, the Moon-Eyed People eventually abandoned their homes, or were driven from it, and traveled west, never to be seen again. Some people believe that these Moon-Eyed People never left and are hiding out in the Appalachian Mountains, living in underground caves and only coming out at night. Today, exhibits on the Moon-Eyed People can be found at the Cherokee County Historical Museum in Murphy. There is actually a three-foot-tall sculpture of two conjoined figures thought to represent the Moon-Eyed People, which was found in the early 1840s, and you can see that at this museum. Oh, so this isn't them depicting what they think they looked like. This is something from way back when. From the 1800s that they found and they put it in the museum. Ooh. Wild. I mean, this sounds like little big-eyed leprechauns. I know. That's what I was thinking, too, whenever I pictured it. As I get deeper into this episode, there's way spookier ones that are going to come out. And that's my next guest of the episode. You cannot have a spooky story without a monster. And the Flatwoods monster takes the cake. In the late days of summer, 1952, two brothers named Edward and Fred May of Flatwoods, West Virginia, rushed home to tell their mother, Kathleen, that they'd seen something unexplainable. While playing football at the playground of the Flatwood School, they witnessed a bright UFO streak across the sky and land on the property of a local farmer. Intrigued, Kathleen, her sons, and some other local boys headed out to the farm. <laughs> I love that the mom just completely <laughs> takes them at their words. Instead of being like, let's call the police. She's, she's like, like let's no, go. let's get the neighborhood kids and let's go figure out let's what this go. is. Right. It was nearing dusk when they saw an unidentified object in the woods. It appeared to be glowing red with smoke and steam coming off of it. 17-year-old Eugene Lemon, a National Guardsman who'd also tagged along on the adventure, said he saw a pulsing light and pointed his flashlight towards it. What was revealed was a pair of bright eyes in a tree and a mysterious-looking figure, approximately 10 feet tall, with a round, blood-red face, a large, pointed, hood-like shape around the face, eyes like shapes which emitted greenish-orange light, and a dark black or green body. The figure also had small, claw-like hands. Nope. <laughs> it's a no for me. So scary. The monster then hissed and floated towards the group, causing Eugene to scream and drop his flashlight. Don't blame him. No, I'd poop my pants. <laughs> yeah. According to newspaper reports, several of the party fainted and vomited for several hours after returning to town due to fear, but also this pungent mist that came out of the creature. What a weird choice of a weapon, like a pungent mist. This is ringing a bell now. Didn't it smell like sulfur? I didn't see that. I'm sure it probably did. To me, a pungent smelling mist 
aligns with the sulfur smell. I know you all are going to hate me for saying this word, but I do not need moist, pungent smells coming <laughs> my direction. With a creature that's hissing at you with little claws coming out of like a UFO. After this interaction, the group turned around and ran down the hill, immediately reporting what they saw to the local sheriff. An hour later, several men armed with shotguns returned to the scene with Eugene, the National Guardsman. They were met with a horrible smell and, according to local reports, saw slight heat waves in the air. Authorities didn't find much, but they did see skid marks from a large object and an odd gummy deposit on the ground. Ew! <laughs> this alien needs to get up on his hygiene! Seriously. They gathered the gummy deposit and sent it to Washington, D.C., but never heard back about it, which is instantly suspicious to me. Of course. Let me guess it was a weather balloon. Something like that. What makes the Flatwoods monster so interesting is that there weren't a whole lot of UFO sightings back in the 1950s. So sometimes you can say, well, that was really popular during this specific time. Of course, everything looks like an alien or UFO. But... The Flatwoods incident was only the second or third of its kind, specifically in this part of the U.S. It was probably actually the first with so many witnesses because of all the people that ran up there, and it made national headlines. Today, on the main road into town, there is a sign that reads, Welcome to Flatwoods, home of the green monster. The UFO sighting, or whatever it was, is in the past but not forgotten. There are some true believers who think it was a UFO and an alien, while others are skeptics who think it was a misidentified barn owl. <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I've seen a few owls in my day. None of them came in flying saucers. They, best of my memory, did not smell horrible and misty and moist. And they didn't leave goo behind. Mm -mm. Or hiss at you and like float towards you. I mean... Barn owls, like, they're flapping their wings. You know, they're, it's yeah, a big production. Yeah, I mean, owls are kind of creepy in and amongst themselves. They're very, Agree. like, mystical, haunting creatures. But, yeah, I've never seen any of them do any of the stuff that was said. And let's just remember, they have wings. They don't need to be flying around in saucers. <laughs> UFOs. <laughs> so we've talked about this creepy UFO alien guy. And there's another legend, the legend of the Mothman. Oh, absolutely not. I know this one. This one's terrifying. And the picture I'll post on Instagram, it's <laughs> it's really scary. On November 15th, 1966, two young couples from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, Roger and Linda Scarberry, and Steve and Mary Mattel, told police they saw a large gray creature whose eyes glowed red when the car's headlights picked it up. They described this creature as a large flying man with a 10-foot wingspan and he was following their car while they were driving. This legend, for whatever reason, scares the absolute... I wish y'all could see my arms. It's ghost pimples. This... Ghost pimples? What are those? <laughs> All right, new phrase. They're not goose pimples anymore. They're, They're ghost, ghost pimples. pimples. <laughs> I... It terrifies me. It's going to get scarier. During the next few days, other people reported similar sightings. Two volunteer firemen who saw it said it was a large bird with red eyes. The Mason County Sheriff named George Johnson commented that he believed the sightings were an unusually large heron, which is a long-legged, long-necked bird that does hang out on the East Coast. A contractor named Newell Partridge told the sheriff that when he aimed a flashlight at this creature that resembled it, its eyes glowed red. I've seen those at, like, my parents' pond growing up. They're not gro growing red, and they're not this big. Like, big enough or in the, the dark. The 10-foot crane, basically, they look like a crane. It is not a ta – no. That's bigger than an ostrich. Yeah, it's huge. Some believe the Mothman is a bad omen, only appearing when catastrophe is about to strike. There have been many claims that this winged, red-eyed creature was seen right before the Point Pleasant Silver Bridge collapse in 1967. There haven't really been a whole lot of sightings from the time that he was first spotted. But in 2016, that suddenly changed when a man was driving along State Route 2 and he saw something jumping from tree to tree. He pulled off the road and he snapped some pictures. The man was adamant that the pictures had not been doctored. He said he had recently moved to Point Pleasant for work and didn't even know about this legend of the Mothman. These photos are freaking terrifying. 
Normally, I would say the person is out for money or fame, but the man refused to give his name and he even declined an on-camera interview. So he didn't gain anything from releasing these photos, but the photos he captured truly look like this man in the sky with these huge black wings. It's, it's terrifying. Did anything bad happen after he saw this? No. He just said it was basically jumping from the trees. Oh, so maybe this, maybe Mothman, I got to give him a little benefit of the doubt. Maybe he can't help his appearance. <laughs> He's, he's just, like a little outcast. He's just, he's doing his best being 10 foot tall and winged and creepy and glowing red eyes. But maybe if he was trying to warn him, maybe he kind of comes in peace. He's just, I don't know. He I just like happens that to look really scary in the process of it. I do like that thought. Like a little kid who just happened to grow a bunch of feathers and was like banned <laughs> to the Appalachian Mountains. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's actually that. kind of creepy too. I know. <laughs> it is. But to your point, there's so many like legends and stories out there and they all do have some kind of truth behind them. Next up is a little bit of a touchy subject because it involves mental health. So I want to give a little trigger warning that I am talking about the Trans Allegion Lunatic Asylum, also known as the Weston State Hospital. This asylum is located deep in the heart of West Virginia, surrounded by sweeping grounds and green lawns. The building itself is honestly beautiful. It has a tall steeple in the center, and it looks like an expensive boarding school, but also like something out of a Stephen King novel. It's located on 666 acres of land, it which is, is not a fact that I could not leave out, and it's currently abandoned. When the asylum was commissioned in the early 1850s, its conception marked one of the first hopeful developments in centuries for mental health patients. The building was the brainchild of Thomas Story Kirkbird, a doctor and crusader for the mentally ill who founded what would later become the American Psychiatric Association, solid guy all around. The doctor emphasized the importance of light and fresh air, suggesting that asylums be built as long hallways with 12-foot ceilings, plenty of windows, and ventilation that allowed for cross breezes. He also emphasized freedom. Mental health patients, he felt, should be allowed to roam as much as possible and find simulation for their minds. They would behave better, not worse, if given more control over their own lives. I really appreciate his way of thinking. Absolutely, because we all know up until this point that was not the case. Mm -mm. It was super out of the ordinary for asylums back in the 1800s. And if you look at photos of this building, it's clear that it was set up to be a really successful, safe, and first-of-its-kind place for people who struggled with their mental health. Unfortunately, in 1881, disaster struck. Due to an increase in mental health diagnosis and the stigma surrounding the disease, this once tranquil facility became overrun, housing almost 500 more patients than they ever imagined. Originally, it was meant to house 250, but at this point in time, capacity had reached nearly 800 patients, and the hospital could not keep up. Conditions began to decline dramatically. Patients were crammed together with sometimes four or five to a room intended for one. There was also a working farm on the compound designed to provide for 300 patients, and this farm was obviously unable to meet the increased demands for food due to the overcrowding. Patients began to suffer from malnutrition, which only exacerbated mental health issues. By 1938, the Trans Allegion Lunatic Asylum was six times over capacity. The patients inside were running wild, and orderlies outnumbered struggled to regain control of the hospital. At its peak in 1950, the hospital was holding 2,600 patients. What? And it was meant for how much, Annie? 250. To expose the terrible conditions within, the Charlestown Gazette attempted to send in a crew to investigate the inner workings of the asylum. I think we've seen this in like American Horror Story where a reporter goes in and tries to kind of uncover what's going on. But what they found shocked them. Patients were sleeping on the floor and in freezing rooms due to a lack of furniture and heat. The overcrowding had resulted in overworked staff and a decreased emphasis on sanitation. The once bright, clear windows were covered with grime, darkening and further chilling the rooms. The wallpaper was peeling from decay and where it hadn't disintegrated, patients had ripped it off in a panic because they were just so distraught. What was even worse was the condition of the patients. Those whom the orderlies deemed, quote, unable to be controlled, end quote, had been locked in cages 
in open spaces like hallways in an attempt to make more bedrooms available for less troubled some patients. Locked in cages? These in the are hallway. humans. So sad. At this time, the asylum had also become a training ground for experimental lobotomies, oh, which we all Lord. know that word, as Walter Freeman, the famous surgeon and lobotomy advocate, opened up shop at this location. In the course of his lifetime, Dr. Freeman performed around 4,000 lobotomies, leaving sometimes perfectly healthy patients with lasting physical and cognitive damage, and even some died due to the procedure. He used the infamous ice pick method, which involved slipping a thin pointed rod like an ice pick into the patient's eye socket and using a hammer to force it to sever the connective tissue in the brain's prefrontal cortex. And this resulted in a number of deaths as well. By the time the asylum closed, only one part of its grounds had been expanded to accommodate the new demand, the graveyard. The ex so sad, right? Like these patients could this not speak is, up for themselves. This is and just awful. The image I'm getting in my mind of this place and how scary it must be for these people that are already suffering, no fault of their own. And then mm -hmm. their families maybe are putting them in this place hoping for the best and like, oh, they're going to get treatment. They're going to do this. And now – Instead of getting any of that, they're getting ice picks through their eyeballs, all sorts of crazy experiments, and now they have to expand upon it by building a graveyard instead of getting people out of cages? It's awful. The expose published by the Gazette spurred a movement to close down the hospital, but it wasn't until 1994, after more than 100 years of horror, that the asylum closed its doors forever. Now the once beautiful building intended for healing, but destined for destruction, sits abandoned as if the patients simply vanish into thin air. Rooms are still filled with medical equipment and old furniture and wheelchairs still sit in the hallways. Of course, there's now ghost tours that happen here, but other than that, no one else ever is on the facility or Could on the property. Could you imagine what kind of energy that place would have? Well, a reporter named Marisa Cascino, who did a 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. ghost tour of the asylum, which uh, I would never do, recounted her time spent in an article. According to her tour guide, the hospital has seen some better-known spirits, including a little girl named Lily, who was born in the asylum, a man named Jesse, who died of a heart attack in a bathtub, Civil War soldiers, and a patient who was brutally murdered by his roommates. She said when she went there, nothing super spooky stood out, but the thought of these spirits roaming the halls is just heartbreaking like they're still trapped there that always has been to me it's more sad than scary because like these spirits are just there and one of the guys um the marisa talks about how she would light a cigarette because he liked them and she would see like balls move and she's like there's no way this was an outside force like someone messing with her it was absolutely a spirit and he liked the cigarette smoke and it's just oh i don't know it's so sad Okay, last up to finish up this episode is the mystery of what is actually living in the Appalachian Mountains. And this fear really is fueled by TikTok. If you know by me, I'm always on TikTok. If you search hashtag Appalachian Mountains, you are going to see some creepy things pop up. People on TikTok who are living in the mountains have a few rules. Number one, never look outside your window at night. You will see things in the forest you wish you wouldn't have. Number two, at sundown, close all your windows and curtains. Number three, lock your doors, obviously. These all sound like good rules. <laughs> They're just best practices. Yes. <laughs> Number four, if you go outside, stay alert. Number five, trust your gut. Number six is kind of scary. If nature suddenly goes quiet, calmly remove yourself from that area. Number seven, if you hear your name or screaming coming from the woods, ignore it. And number eight, what? never whistle. You will call them. Who's them? I just got goosebumps. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, who's them? According to the people who live in the Appalachian Mountains, there are spirits and creatures deep within the woods, and they call them haints or ghosts. The word haint is an alternative spelling of haunt, which was historically used in Southern African American vernacular to refer to a ghost or in hoodoo belief, a witch-like creature seeking to chase victims to their death by exhaustion. Wait, repeat that one more time? They chase them to, to their death, death by exhaustion. So for me, it'd be a half a mile. <laughs> Got <laughs> Into it. Into the woods. And like, what creeps me out is if I ever heard my name from the woods or I heard screaming, 
I would probably start going that way. Like, oh, wait, there's someone in there who knows me. Like they're calling my name. And people on TikTok are like, do not do that. And if you whistle, so the, you're going to summon The woods are them. calling out to you? Something in the woods. Ooh. What's really interesting is that people in this part of the region actually paint their houses, most of the times their doors, a shade of blue called haint blue. And it's a special color that's said to ward off evil spirits and curses. So they believe in this. And I believe in this, honestly, because okay. they believe in it. I'm like, why me, just the door? The Wear paint blue pajamas, have it all over your house, your sidewalk, your mailbox should be blue. It's so scary. Something about yeah. hearing like, Elise, Annie from the woods. <gasps> it's scary. In some of these videos, they will literally be on their front porch like recording and you can hear the most odd screaming coming from the woods it's not a human out there being like i'm gonna go i mean, sleep it might be and i'm the one getting fooled <laughs> i'm so gullible with stuff like this but one author who grew up in this region writes about um her life in this fiction book called blood root by amy green it tells the story of a family in the appalachian mountains that's been living under a curse for generations Amy ties a lot of her childhood back to the story, and I definitely ordered the audiobook off Amazon. I'm super excited to listen to it. Um, but she talks about how in the story, the girl's eyes are a haint blue, and the interviewee interviewer is like, what's that? And so she describes how that keeps away the spirits. Um, she also said that if you're from the area, you, area, you pronounce it Appalachia. If you're Appalachia. not, you say Appalachia, Appalachia, Appalachia Mountains. I obviously call it Appalachia because I grew up in Indiana, so not too far from it. And I always thought it was Appalachia, but good to know for anyone living there who's like fuming because I'm saying Appalachia. <laughs> I know it's Appalachia. <laughs> What's important to remember is that this region has a lot of amazing culture and folklore. And I personally enjoy reading and looking into these legends and myths because a lot of it ties back to ancestors who passed it down. Hope our scary squad enjoyed this episode because Sunday is all about, I'm not giving it up. <laughs> to a I was like, Annie, you can't tell my secrets. I, I would never do that to you. <laughs> but it, this does make me curious because, like you said, you have these rumors and myths around certain areas that are passed down through families. So if you guys live somewhere where there is something that is about your area, like the Mothman, for instance, in North Carolina, I believe it was what you said, uh -huh. Uh -huh. or just different little theories and myths and folklore around your town, please send them in. You can go to www.caseofthesundayscaries.com and please on that case submission, just put in the subject line like spooky story or yeah. hometown or something along those lines so that we can see it because I would love to know what other folklore you guys grew up hearing about. I love it. I'm looking forward to that. Otherwise, now that I have ghost pimples, as we're going to call them from <laughs> here on out, all over, and thank you for putting probably terrible thoughts and terrible dreams in my head tonight. Annie, appreciate that <laughs> when I really, really could use some deep sleep. We're back on our normal schedule, so I will be back Sunday. We will be talking about some of the worst ways to die you've ever heard of, and most historians would agree. I'm excited, but also nervous. But Annie, again, I appreciate you. Thanks to everyone who has been following along this month. We have some such, such exciting news coming down the pipeline, so you only have to bear with us for about two more weeks till we start dropping hints at what's to come. But as always, we appreciate the Scary Squad for tuning in, and we will see you Sunday, but until then. 